practice of the Christian faith is guided by the love commandment. Really, the double love commandment that Jesus put together from his own scriptures in Deuteronomy and Leviticus when he said, in answer to the question of the greatest commandment, it is to love God, your God, the Lord, with all that you are, with everything that is in you, and to love your neighbor as yourself. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says that a little differently to his disciples in the upper room when he says, uh, a new commandment I give you that you love one another, even as I have loved you. But perhaps uh, the best version of that is uh, my wife's favorite scripture from 1 John. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. Those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. And if you say, I love God and hate my brother or sister, you are not, you you are a liar. You cannot love a brother or sister whom you have seen if you don't love God whom you have not seen. All of this certainly applies to how we deal with, first of all, our family. And, And sometimes at home, we are at our most relaxed, we know everybody else's foibles, and uh, we're there all the time, and so it's easy to not be loving even with our family at times. It certainly also applies to how we live with the rest of the church. We are, after all, one body of Christ, members one of another, and so we're called to a special love for one another. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples, they will know you are my followers by the love with which you have for one another. But it also means uh, going beyond that, going beyond the inner circles uh, to include all people and even love of enemy uh, and praying for those who who persecute you. This love toward one another is based in God's love for us, for all. All people are created by God and equally loved by God. That is a key truth of the New Testament, which Peter learned when God sent him first a vision and then a challenge to go with those to a house that he was not familiar with. And when he got up, when he got to the house of Cornelian, the Roman centurion, and got up to speak the word, he began by saying, I truly understand now that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Today's second scripture lesson is part of a passage in Colossians that says Jesus' followers are uh, to be resurrection people. They're to live in new life of the resurrection. And so that means, first of all, putting off the old nature, and Paul spells out some of the things that are part of that, uh, selfish indulgences, as well as hostile hostility in relationship with others. And then we are to put on the new nature, which is love. Love that is being formed in us and love toward which we are progressing to be in the fullness of Christ's love at the end of time. Paul says, living in this image, therefore, there is no, there's not Greek or Jew, there's not slave or free, there's not barbarian, Scythian, circumcised, uncircumcised. There are no divisions because Christ is all things and in all people. So we live without prejudice toward others because distinctions are broken down since Christ is in all people. And through our connection with him, we're connected with all people. Certainly, this is a message that uh, resonates with the person whose birthday we celebrate this weekend. Dr. Martin Luther King embodied the message of love. He lived and died for that message. 
And he showed that love is not like Jesus, not simply a passive niceness, but love is active, truthful, and risky, willing to confront the powers that be and confront the po people who hold power when they are in the wrong in holding back any person, whether it was racial discrimination against African Americans and other people of color, the neglect of the poor, the blindness to the rights of garbage workers, or people being killed in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. But his birthday reminds us not only of the past, but of the unfinished business that we have today. The past two years have been a reminder that, uh, of the unfinished business we have. In fact, we've seen a resurgence of thinly veiled and sometimes completely unveiled racism. Just three days ago, several non-white nations were slurred by a vulgarity and yes, we can have a civil debate about immigration and its policies and its limits, although the Bible would remind us we're called to care for the alien, the foreigner in our midst. But people of faith must reject racist language and racist thinking and call to accountability those who would purvey that. It's not a partisan issue but one simply of decency, and for us, it's a matter of faith. Loving all also speaks to another divide that sometimes affects us. How do we see people who differ in faith? We're called to recognize God's grace in people of other faith backgrounds. I've experienced that personally over my years, now 70, first with people of other Christian backgrounds. Over the last 50 years, I have been greatly blessed by people who are Presbyterian, Baptist, Catholic, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Mennonite, Quaker, African Methodist, Episcopal, uh, Pentecostal, uh, Eastern Orthodox, and I could go on. Each of people from different faith traditions that are part of Christianity have enriched my own journey. But second of all, it has led me to relationship, discussion, and study with people of other faiths. Shortly after I came to Evansville, Rabbi David Fader called together the uh, clergy leaders and faith leaders of various community groups and, and tried to start something new in terms of interfaith work in Evansville. Out of that initiative 16 and a half years ago came an interfaith study group where I found great stimulation to my mind, to my heart, and to my spirit. From four different rabbis and two good set of friends who are Jewish and from several visits to the synagogue, I have learned so much more about the Jewish roots of our own faith. I've seen the richness of the First Testament in a new light through Jewish eyes and the depth of contemporary Jewish faith and practice. Over the last 16 years, I've come to know dozens of people from Evansville's Islamic community, toured their former mosque and visited several times their new Islamic center and eaten their wonderful food. Even if nothing else had fazed me, the food would have gotten to me, whether at the festival or any time they host an event. I've come to know the faithfulness with which most of them practice the five prayers a day, usually in private, but I was also privileged uh, early on after Patty had started the Women in Faith group with the Islamic Center, we were invited to the home of the Sakabs and then in Carmi, Illinois, and and I got to be the designated van driver for the women in faith. And we went there to share a meal at the end of the day, at the, after night had fallen during Ramadan. And before we ate, the family first of all prayed. And I was inspired by the very bodily and humble way in which they stretched themselves out to God. 
And several of you have, like me, also been in the Islamic Center when they've done evening prayers, and we've heard the, the beautiful melodic recitation of Quranic scriptures as well as the devotion. In small groups, I've heard Dr. Hussein recount his journey of faith, how he grew up in Pakistan and assumed everything he learned about Islam was, was all there was to Islam and then came to America some 40 years ago and met Muslims from other countries and realized there were differences in how Islam was practiced and some of those differences were cultural. And so he began to look at his faith again, but he also was with Christians and Jews and people of other faiths and, and as he interacted, he began to appreciate their faith and grow from their faith and be challenged by their faith as, as he interacted. And as I've heard Dr. Hussein tell his journey of how his faith grew in perspective, I could identify very much with my own journey. I've also, as I said, been in the home of Dr. Sakab and his wife Bushra, and we've also had them in our home. And, and I've, had, I've heard both of them talk about their journey of faith, how uh, as they've grown, they've begun to look at their Muslim faith more in terms of its interiority, its, its basics, and, and some of the outer things that they learned early on, they begin to say, I'm, I'm not sure that's of the essence. I want to go to the essence. And every time Dr. Dr. Sakab, Sakab speaks in public and quotes from the Quran, at some point along the way, he gets tears in his eyes and his voice breaks as he talks about God and it's evident that he has such awe and reverence for God and uh, has such a, uh, an intimate sense of relationship with God. I've gotten to know Mary McGregor and, and her Buddhist practice and I've learned so much as she's talked about things like mindfulness and non-dual consciousness, words that are starting to integrate into our society, but concepts that are very helpful, and I've now looked back at scriptures and seen how some of those are in Jesus' thoughts, different words, but very much similar ideas. From Karuna Pandit, I've seen again the deep unity that the, Muslim, the Hindu faith looks at all creation, and, and God is a part of everything. And I was brought back to my experience in college of taking a course on Eastern religions and just being really in awe of that perspective. Um, and then I've looked at the New Testament and I've seen some of that same mystical sense of our unity in God, particularly in Paul's writings. 16 years of interfaith experience has led me to appreciate people of other faiths, and to appreciate their faith. First, I have seen the commonality in some of the basic things, a, a view of God as being the source of all, and God as being good and loving and just, as well as in some of the basic things of how we live as people who know God. Secondly, I've come to appreciate the differences in experience, tradition, and practice and have felt enriched by learning how others have come to know God and experience God's guidance in their life. The result has been a broader understanding of God and how grace works. And those experiences have deepened my own faith. Rather than leading me to question my faith uh, or be more or dilute my faith, I have found they have helped me to go deeper in my own faith as well as appreciating other people's experience with God. These interactions have led to the understanding that clearly where God's grace is present, Christ is at work. The issue is not whether the other person uses the same words in their theology uh, or follows Jesus consciously as I do, but uh, how each person is living and growing in the grace of God that is revealed in Jesus and how they are living a life of integrity, love, and concern for others, especially those who have the least 
money, power, and status. This fits with a biblical understanding that God is the creator of all and the guide of all. While Abraham was chosen to, to uh, be the father of a special nation with a special relationship with God and for his descendants to inherit the land, God also made it clear that God would bless through him and his descendants all nations of the world. In the Old Testament, uh, there are several places where it's shown that God works through non-Hebrew people. For instance, King Cyrus of Persia is called God's servant several times in Isaiah 40 through 50. The New Testament says that God is not left without a witness in any culture or time. Creation itself helps us to know God, and the Creator's ways are evident. The Bible also reflects there's a yearning for God in all human hearts, and that leads us at least to the beginning of knowledge about God. In John 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he goes on to say, I have other sheep who are not of this fold. I must lead them too. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Does that not suggest that God's plan for Christ may be greater than what we are able to see, and that can include others that we don't see in our churches? I've studied the Bible regularly and seriously, especially over the last perhaps 60 years. And I know that there are passages in the Bible that, particularly the New Testament, seem to say that Jesus is the way to know God. There are others that say God's work is universal and beyond the onefold. I've wrestled with how to put together those seeming inconsistencies, and this is what I've come to. I first of all recognize that the Bible is primarily addressed to the community of that of our faith, whether it was the Jewish faith uh, in the Old Testament, talking to the children of Israel about how to live out their faith, or to the church, telling us to how to live out our Christian faith. And so those passages that sound exclusive, I see as being meant for us in the church, to remind us of the dangers of our going astray valuing other gods and other values higher than we value the one God that we know. They call us to stay on track. They're not there to tell us to condemn other people. After all, that's not our job. The Bible is certainly not trying to tell us that we are better than those others. Rather, the Bible has a consistent message of humility and dependence upon God. And then the passages that are more inclusive reminds us that God is at work in all the world and beyond our own particular faith expression. God's mystery is everywhere. Finally, the evangelical passages, passages call us to witness to the gospel and to grace. Uh, we share our faith because many do need to hear a message of good news and to find some sort of faith, direction, meaning for life. However, that does not mean condemning those of other faiths or those uh, who may already exude some of God's presence, but sharing God's grace and seeing God's grace in them. As Patty's book suggests also, we're all in the same soup. We're all in the soup together, and we're enriched by what we share in our variety. That's even more true today than it ever was in the past, something we all are learning. I don't want to claim that my understanding is the understanding or that I know the mind of Christ. I recognize that God is always beyond my understanding of God in many ways, and I accept the mystery that is there. But what I know is I and we 
are called to live in the spirit of Jesus and to love all people.